Hi, it's Mark Graben. Welcome back to Lean Blog Interviews. It's episode 468 for February 1st, 2023. We're talking today with Dr. Jody Crane. He's a keynote speaker at the upcoming Healthcare Systems Process Improvement Conference, which is brought to us by the Society for Health Systems. I'm a member. I'll be there at the conference again this year, as I usually am. So look for a link about the conference in the show notes. You can still sign up. It's being held February 15th to 17th in Louisville, Kentucky. So as a, a little bit about um, Dr. Jody Crane, you can find a link to his full bio uh, in the show notes. As a proven leader, Dr. Jody Crane is considered one of the leading experts in emergency department operations in the United States. Jody has taught and led healthcare and emergency department improvement efforts with hundreds of organizations in a wide variety of settings on six continents. In this role, he supports clinical quality and safety and performance improvement initiatives for all clinical service lines. He's a co-author of uh, the book that we talked about back in episode 120. The book is titled The Definitive Guide to Emergency Department Operational Improvement, Employing Lean Principles with Current ED Best Practices to Create the No Weight Department. So here's our episode with Dr. Jody Crane. Uh, for links and more, again, look in the show notes or go to leanblog.org slash 468. So Jody, welcome back to the podcast. I, I can't believe it's been um, almost 12 years since episode 120 when you joined us, but welcome back. How are you? I'm doing great, Mark. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing real well. I, I'm excited about the conference and, and and hearing your keynote talk. And you know, I thought we could maybe do a bit of a preview here today, not to to give away the whole um, the whole story for those who are attending. But like, what, what's some of the core message of what you're going to talk about to this conference audience? Yeah. So first of all, Mark, thanks for inviting me. And uh, uh, it's been too long, so we need to yeah. uh, you know get uh, stay in touch more closely. But as you know, I've been pretty busy these days. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's a tough time in healthcare these days. And, and really, I was going to focus the, the the talk on that. So what are the things that are impacting healthcare delivery today uh, that maybe we didn't kind of even hear about or know about back in 2019? Or what are the things that existed back then that are, that are exacerbated either by the pandemic or by fallout from the pandemic, right? So, and, um, you know, it's interesting because uh, you know, early on in my career, I faced a lot of challenges that that all EDs are facing now. So I faced, you know, nursing shortages, physician shortages, not enough beds, flow problems, and and all of those things. And um, you know, the way I dealt with it personally was I got my MBA and I, you know, met Chuck Noon, who was at three degrees in industrial engineering, and I met Keith Leitner, who was, uh, you know. 20 year history in manufacturing, applying lean principles. And, and I realized that, you know, you can actually affect all of these things using lean principles and industrial engineering techniques. And I, I guess, um, you know, I was going to kind of mention what I think the, the big three are these days and try to keep it a three because there's, there's probably a hundred and, uh, but, but they all kind of fall in some big categories. One is, variation in demand in healthcare. You know, the pandemic has brought this like really unprecedented uh, demand impact, right? So, uh, you know, early on in the pandemic in the in the March 2020, we saw our volumes drop 50% just in the emergency department. That's never happened in the history right. of emergency medicine. Uh, we saw entire, basically across the country, elective surgery stopped, right? That's never happened before. And, and so, as we've kind of progressed through the pandemic, we we we're still dealing with those things, right? We're we're not even back to 2019. You know, we're down still six percent to ten percent from 2019 volumes that we saw before. But but you know, it's okay if you're on kind of a level rate. But but what we're seeing is still significant variation uh, day by day, week by week, month by month. And as you know variation is is really challenging from a performance right. improvement perspective right the, the the other thing i think is really important is capacity right so you know we've got we've got more challenging demand patterns than we've ever seen and we've got really significant issues in capacity um and that being nursing capacity right physician capacity um pretty much everybody who works in the healthcare system uh you know especially if you were here before all of this started 
they're pretty burnt out and they, mm-hmm. they, they've, the way they've always known healthcare, even when it wasn't great, mm-hmm. now they're just seeing these challenges and they're saying, I'm, I'm just don't want to work in healthcare anymore. Yeah. And if, if I stay in healthcare, you need to pay me more. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we've seen that in nursing with $200 an hour rates for travelers in the last couple of years. Yeah. We've seen that on the physician side, 10% or so of people have basically left. And, mm-hmm. you know, maybe some of those were people who were kind of planning to retire earlier uh, or planning to retire anyway, but maybe some of those are people who are just like, I can't take it anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but we're seeing it in radiology techs and lab techs and everything is just more challenging to staff in general, right? Mm -hmm. Those are two basic equations for for queuing and for performance improvement and the key focus of of lean, right? Um, And then on top of that, right, which is totally separate and unrelated, we've got these healthcare reimbursement issues, right? You've heard about the No Surprises Act. You've heard about Medicare payment cuts. So, you know, we've got wages, um, or workers kind of demanding more to work. We've got a shortage of workers, which is affecting the whole supply and demand curve. And then we've got um, this massive variation that really, really drives um, a really challenging staffing paradigm, right? Because right. one of the ways to, to deal with variation is to uh, to build in more surge capacity, right? That surge capacity costs money. Mm-hmm. So, um, so those are kind of three big issues I'm going to dive in really deeply in the HSPI conference. And um, I, I think we got to solve those moving forward. Yeah. Well, I look forward to hearing, you know, more during that talk of, you know, diagnosis and treatments, if you will, for all of that. Um, you know, one follow-up question that comes to mind, though, I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of emphasis on pay. And that's important to people, of course. Um, then there's also questions around working conditions and, and culture. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on what else beyond good pay do we do organizations need to be providing? If people aren't quitting and leaving because of compensation issues, we know there are other causes of burnout. What, what, what are some of the prescriptions, if you will, to, to create a better working environment? Yeah. And, and and actually, I would say people probably aren't leaving because of pay. Mm-hmm. They're just demanding higher wages because the work environment is so difficult. Right. And I think I think that's an important distinction. And I'm glad you made it. Um, what I'll say, and I'll, I'll actually I'll actually paint this picture with with maybe a snapshot of what we're dealing with in emergency medicine. So right now, on any given day, um, we've got more patients being cared for in the waiting room than ever before. Right. Because, and it's a trickle down, right? We can't find enough nurses to staff the inpatient units. We close beds on the inpatient units that creates boarding in the emergency department that allows us no space to care for these really, really sick uh, emergency patients. So, you know, one way to deal with that is to keep pushing care further and further out front. And, you know, as you know, kind of, I, I was kind of on the front end of that whole innovation and front end programs in the emergency department 20 years ago yeah. with with the idea that if you just get, get people in process sooner after their arrival and we get them, uh, that's the best way to shorten their length of stay and get them back home with a satisfying high quality experience that, that really does everything that Lean tells you we need to do. Yeah. The problem is... Um, it's it's really um, everything we talked about before. So the variation demand, the lack of um, people that are able to care for these patients has driven this waiting room medicine kind of to, to the brink even. Mm-hmm. So um, there's hospitals that you walk into, um, you know, in the middle of the day and every single bed in the emergency department is taking up, taken up with borders and every single patient is seen in the waiting room. And so, so that, that whole concept of me uh, as an emergency physician or as a nurse or as a, as a, as a, you know, phlebotomist or or an x-ray tech, having to go out and provide care for patients in the waiting room is very dissatisfying. And I think most people working in that system feel like they're not delivering the care that they could if the patient were in a quiet room and um, they had the, all the resources they needed. So I think more, more than anything, it's 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 sort of this deterioration in the system and the capacity mm-hmm. of the system 
And, and frankly, the resources that you need to feel like you're delivering high quality care is probably the primary uh, driver of this burnout and this lack of satisfaction. I think if we fix yeah. that, mm-hmm. then, then people uh, will come back to the system and they will work in the system. A- another element of it is um, the risk. And when I say risk, I mean, okay, I'm taking care of a patient in a very imperfect situation. Um, and I'm I'm basically heroically working around mm. all of the imperfections that currently exist. And I'm del- I'm trying to deliver the best care I can for a patient, but but things are gonna happen, right? And so we don't even know contextually, we know that. That patients are getting the same care they were nine, you know, in 2019. But what we don't know is what what is going to happen from a malpractice perspective. And, you know, oh. that takes five years to kind of fully vet. You know, a couple two to three years to actually uh, generate a lawsuit, and then two to three years to to kind of get through that lawsuit. We don't, you know, we don't know what impact the the imperfect system we're working in today is going to create down the road. But I can tell you a lot of physicians and other folks working in the system feel like they're putting their licenses at risk mm-hmm. by working in these imperfect systems. So we yeah. need to we need to change um, the way we support our everybody who works in emergency departments and hospitals, the way they feel they're supported and and do whatever we can to give them the resources they need to care for patients. Yeah. So you you mentioned burnout, um, and that's been a problem for a long time uh, in healthcare. When when you 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 paint this picture of not just legal risk, but I'm sure what must be a really awful feeling of not being able to provide the right care to patients. Um, there, there's a word that it's not a new phrase, but I've been hearing it more and been trying to learn about it. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you run across this phrase, moral injury, that tries to describe the impact of not being able to provide the right care and, and, and what that means to, to clinicians. It seems like it goes, it's stronger or runs deeper than burnout. What, what are you hearing or, or thinking about that? Yeah, that term has come up um, over the last probably two to three years, and it, and it actually evolved literally out of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and <clears throat> I think it's an accurate reflection of, of of some of the challenges that we have. So early on in the pandemic, if you remember, we didn't even knew, we didn't even know what COVID was. Right, right. It, it, we had no idea if it was going to kill us. So as as healthcare providers, we were walking into this giant unknown. And right. and if you remember, we didn't even have N95s. We didn't have right. any protection. A uh, whole global kind of supply chain was was shut down. Hmm. And and you know. I remember coming home from a shift and, uh, you know, having to take off my clothes in the garage just right. so because I didn't know what the potential impact to my family was. And so so there's this kind of running into the fire mentality, but it's running into the fire without a hose, yeah. right, or without an axe. And right. so that the whole concept of moral injury really is about sort of forcing one to face circumstances that are be- are are beyond their control or uncontrollable with without even a hope of kind of doing their best right, right. now that's what that's how i characterize it so so prior to the pandemic yeah we had burnout we had people that were working a lot they were working too hard they you know uh, you know early on in my career i told you you know I, I had a challenge in my emergency department we overcame that challenge because it was overcomable yeah. but um but I'll tell you, like, there's this kind of th- that moral injury is is what a lot of of and, and I'm not just talking about physicians and in nurse practitioners, PAs, but everybody working in the healthcare system kind of feels they're they're kind of set up to fail walking into their shift. Yeah, and it's just it's just really really challenging, and it's hard to find that that one or two people out there that are really pushing for you. Yeah. really trying to support you, you know, and it goes all the way up to the government. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's understandable where that would lead to all sorts of feelings, including um, resentment. And um, like you said, those were serious. Uh, it's hard to even say, I mean, it's just serious problems and, and situations that you, you wish nobody 
um, had had been put in. Um, you know, you you Jody, you mentioned you know imperfect systems, and that includes you know ongoing imperfect systems around even in normal times, um, the flow of supplies. Um, you know, creating problems and, 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 and challenges, in some cases, you know, exacerbated um, by the pandemic and, and, and those lingering supply chain effects. But, you know, when you talk about systems and, you know, you describe some of the symptoms as seen in the emergency department, but as you know, and as you write about and help people understand, there, there are broader value stream issues in the lean language. Like what are, are there positive examples you've seen out there of, of organizations realizing, okay, we need we need to look at the value stream. We don't need just more space in the emergency department or more people. Like that might help in a temporary way, but how, are, are, there, are there good examples of, of, of trying to help address the broader value stream? Yeah. And, um, you know, Mark, that's a heavily loaded question, right? Because, um, you know, if you think about the big picture in healthcare, right? There's so many inputs, right? You got the elective surgery schedule, you got the non-elective schedules uh, schedule, you got inpatient demand, and then you've got all those outflows to uh, post-acute care, back to home, and that sort of thing. And uh, you know, it's really challenging because they're all interrelated, right? We know the relationship between the elective uh, OR schedule, for example, and inpatient crowding, the hospital crowding, you know, we know that's closely tied to the OR schedule, right? Mm -hmm. We know that it's difficult to get patients out of the hospital and into post-acute facilities um, where that kind of, uh, where that seamless transition hasn't been established, right? We know that um, that uh, some emergency departments get overcrowded and they're related to other things within the system. I'll tell you, um, yes, I think it's solvable by um, by engineering, right? Mm-hmm. And um, in differences in the way we do things. And and I, I guess I could give you a couple of, of examples that are pandemic related, mm-hmm. um, but um, but I think really tangible in terms of like things that we could potentially do that we're we're maybe not exploring right now. And one would be um, the memorials down in in South Florida when the pan- pandemic came around. Um, we uh, we at Team Health we staff all of their inpatient um, hospital medicine programs, and you know they really acknowledged very early on that, that they're going to hit get hit pretty hard. If you remember, uh, South Florida in particular was at least the epicenter of the the entire global pandemic at least twice, and maybe three times. I'm not I don't remember, but yeah. But early on, they said we're going to focus on these um, COVID patients, and we're going to put them all in the same unit. And um, we're going to kind of drive their care and and they partnered with us and we kind of we stepped up and we staffed every single COVID patient that came through the door. Again, this is this is early on and uh, we didn't we had no idea where it was ultimately going to go. But um, our hospitalist program ended up, you know, you know, one unit turns out wasn't enough. Two units wasn't enough. We ended up um, opening six units over the course of several months and we had to kind of really float in about 20 extra hospitalists in weeks to to kind of handle that demand. But the one thing, and and you could argue that whole patient population is like a value stream, right? Right. It's a patient service family, right? So, um, so that allowed us to do some really innovative things. So one of one of the things that that uh, the memorials do, and I love this, you know, if you think about all, you know, the pandemic and all of these patients brought a significant um, increase in cycle times of our clinicians, right? We had to don and doff PPE. We had to uh, do extra cleaning. Uh, when a family member came in, we had to, you know, it was just very, very challenging to get through these encounters. And and the memorials did one really simple thing. They put a an iPad in the room and an iPad out of the room. Mm. And so not only... So whenever a clinician needed to interact with the patient or their family, and it was a non-clinical thing where they didn't have to touch the patient or evaluate the patient, they would just come zoom in on the the iPad. You could have that face-to-face encounter without consuming PPE, 
but also without the challenges that or the time that that was associated with getting the PPE on and off. And that's yeah. that's one example of, of of sort of an approach that was I thought dramatically different and and saved a lot of time and saved a lot of uh, supplies. And I think there's still a lot of opportunity for us to to re-engineer things. Mm-hmm. But if you think yeah. about the things that we talked about earlier, you know, we don't have enough nurses. We probably don't have enough clinicians out there. So, so really, I think this, the whole kind of lean principles around uh, eliminating waste, uh, you know, improving right. flow, focusing, you know, all of that is really critical for the future. So, so Jody, you, you know, you talk about this, this value stream, and I think you've touched on it, but maybe you can elaborate on, on the challenge where, let's say, the organization that has the emergency departments and the inpatient beds doesn't control the entire extended value stream, if you will. It goes across multiple organizations. Are there you know, kind of particular lessons about trying to navigate working with other organizations or other budgets or you know uh, things that you don't control as an organization? Well, uh, you know, Mark, that's a great question. Now, frankly, I think that's something we don't necessarily do great today in healthcare mm-hmm. because um, you know the healthcare delivery system is relatively fragmented, right? So we have we have uh, you know outpatient urgery, ur- urgent care, um, you know, companies. We've got hospital companies. We've got health systems, and some are you know, for profit, some are not for profit, some are academic. And then we've got the whole post-acute system uh, that's that's relatively fragmented as well with some big players. So on the on just sort of the care delivery system side, we've got lots of different um different players. And then same thing on the physician services side, you know, there's there's lots of um groups out there that are pr- trying to um trying to help deliver care. And so so as a health system, you're trying to navigate all of that, right? Do I employ my physicians? Do I bring in an external company to provide services because they've got scale and they can um, help, you know, augment needs on a short-term basis, like I talked about at the memorials? Um, how do I partner or, or um, improve my relationship with long-term care? Mm-hmm. And then some of the things that we saw developed in the pandemic, especially tele- telehealth, telehealth and virtual care exploded, right? It's coming back down now, but also this whole concept of caring for patients at home, right? Mm-hmm. right. And so I guess I would kind of characterize that extended value stream. Like we don't do it well right now, but I think that was going to be one of my really important messages in HSP, the HSBI conference is really about <laughs> instead of, you know, little tiny episodes of care, we need to kind of look at the patient across the continuum, right? We need to be able to address the patient wherever they are, um, either geographically or within their care episode. So one of the things we don't do really well right now, patient comes in the emergency department, they've got pneumonia, they get admitted to the hospital. Maybe they've got some other medical problems that require a short stay in a rehab unit, and Mm -hmm. then they get back home. One thing we don't do well right now is is um, like pay attention to those transitions because every time there's a transition, there's a risk that the patient that information falls through the tr- the cracks and the patient doesn't get the care that was intended for that transition. But also, you know, like like in in Toyota, you know, the early days of Toyota, you know, there's this famous story about how um, you know instead of um, you know, buying up their suppliers, they they developed this philosophy where I'm going to share information with my suppliers. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, Michelin or the tires that they needed for their cars, instead of buying Michelin, right. they said, I'm just going to give you information about the demand for cars so you can better uh, plan your production lines so that we don't have this bullwhip effect mm-hmm. going, going down um, the supply chain. Right. And, and I'd say that's 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 probably one of the bigger opportunities that that we have is to better communicate with mm-hmm. our post-key facilities, better kind of design care pa- pathways that actually end up in the home and um, and then better articulate with the feeders so that the, the suppliers of patients like urgent care centers and that sort of thing so that so that the patient's care is integrated. Right. So it's not like 
I went to an urgent care center. I got a bunch of labs there. And then they sent me to the ER and the ER says, well, I don't trust all the labs that you got there. I'm right. going to repeat all that stuff. And by the way, you didn't send me the x-ray and I can't look at the EKG. And that's all waste, right? Yeah. In the classic lean sense. Right. And, and there's also process opportunities, process improvement opportunities in those transitions, that communication, the handoffs. It's a little bit different situation, but um, you know, I've often had conversations about uh, report. Um, nurse leaving to go home, new nurse coming in, they do that patient handoff. And, you know, if it's 12 hour shifts, that handoff is happening twice a day. There are a lot of problems that come with 12 hour shifts. And if we, if we were to have a conversation around having eight hour shifts, the one objection is, well, that means three handoffs a day and the handoffs are terrible and things would be worse. I'm like, well, wait a minute, why we can improve the handoffs. Like we know that, right. that that's doable. And there's that difference whether it's that or other situations of being like resigned to like, well, that's just how it is versus, Hey, we can improve it. Um, so let me frame it as a question, whether it's to these transitions or, or something else. I, how do you help people work through seeing that this is actually a process improvement opportunity instead of it being doomed to be lousy forever? Well, <clears throat> uh, that's a, that's a great question, Mark. And I know you face this every day. Um, in your consulting world. And um, I, I would say, you know, obviously, like in the in the classic sense, you kind of seize on that burning platform, right? And I would say pre-pandemic, it was actually harder to engage people in the fact that we can't do things the way we're doing them anymore. Mm -hmm. I would say things are sufficiently broken such mm -hmm. that it's relatively easy to engage people in perhaps there's a new way of doing things. One of the, the more recent challenges that I've experienced is everything's so tight, it's hard to get the people together in a Kaizen event or yeah. even, even a group of meetings because they're all so busy, you know, fighting the fires, right? And mm -hmm. so to me, the most challenging thing today is to get them to step outside of the fire to kind of look, you know, look at the process and how we're doing things to maybe prevent the fires from starting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that having been said, I think uh, uh, early on in my kind of healthcare improvement journey, um, I, I think I looked at healthcare as, as people were generally entrenched in the way they do things. It's part of the nature of healthcare, right? We have to prove things are better. Yeah. Um, and that takes years and years and years before we can actually do those things that are better. But I, but I found that as as we kind of advanced this knowledge around performance improvement, I found it was easier and easier and easier as the years went by. Um, still, it's hard when you go into a relatively naive and naive, I mean, uh, someone that hasn't, you know, traditionally been engaged in performance improvement, not like, you know, um, not insightful or anything like that. But mm -hmm. it's it's um, th these naive locations, it's a little bit more difficult to get them on the bus. But when you do, boy, they they get the bug. Right. Yeah. So, I, in short answer to your question, is I think these days with all of the dysfunction, I think if we can get the people in the room, engage them in that future state um, design, I think I think they'll go there because yeah. people are so frustrated. You're that's a, that's a great point about the motivation. If um, you know some of the if people are if it's easier to see the opportunity for improvement, that's great. But then there's the question of time. And how do we make it happen? How do we redesign? How do we even find the time for relatively small tweaks? There's a catch-22, like you said, of staffing shortages. There, you know, there's this traditional mindset of like, well, we need more people, but then you've touched on the other side of the equation of well, we could reduce waste, we could help free up time and make um, you know, help nurses be more effective and spend more of their time on patient care, which has all sorts of great benefits. But there's that catch 22 of realizing we could free up time, but we don't have the time to do the work that would help free up the time. Like it can be really yeah. hard to get that, especially when people are exhausted and in burned out there's, there's potential, but it's just, it's tough. Yeah, no doubt. So one other thing I wanted to touch on uh, before we wrap up here is, you know, you, you, um, your your book came out. I know it was before 2010. It was probably that year or the year before. Uh, I think the um, the first version came out. In, I think 2011, but 
uh, you might have seen a a snapshot earlier than that as my guess, but um, but I think it was 2011. But correct me if I'm wrong. Could have been 29. All blurs together. All right. Well, I, I apologize for not having those dates um, clear in my head either. So the podcast was June 2011. So um, okay. I think the book probably had just um, come out. But you know, in this time, your work and and the work of others, and there's there's been a lot of books, including my own, and um, books by other people. There's more exposure to lean concepts. And there's this high level question of, and what, you know, your assessment that maybe either generally speaking or looking for pockets of where you see the impact of lean versus what we might call the untapped potential for lean. It's not like healthcare has been quote unquote, and I hate this phrase, leaned out because that means all kinds of <laughs> there's awful, no such like, thing. Awful, <laughs> there's no such thing as that. Yeah. Um, that that has all kinds of um, admittedly awful connotations, which is why I don't use the phrase, and I shouldn't have used it there. But you know, it, it's not like lean has been adopted and all the problems were solved, and and, and hooray! You know, I see lots of pockets of excellence, um, and there's still it, it's frustrating sometimes to see the potential that's untapped. How how do you see things? Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. You know, uh, I would say every health system that that I encounter you know, day in and day out has a performance improvement team mm-hmm. um, that is working hard to improve processes. Uh, you know, I, I would say that the complete penetration of lean within organizations is pretty rare to see, um, but you see these pockets of improvement where lean principles were applied. Uh, I will say, you know, with, with my work in our MBA program and um, kind of going out in the field and, you know, giving talks for ASAP and that sort of thing, one of the things I do a lot is I have people raise their hands. And I say, who is, who has ever heard of lean in the room? And, uh, and I say, who has ever heard of queuing theory in the, in the room? Uh, and I say, who has ever read the book, the goal, you know? And, um, when I do that and, and back in the day, uh, call it early two thousands, you know, it was like five or 10% of the room had heard of lean and like 1% had heard of queuing theory and, you know, some people had read the goal, but it was only because they had been through some sort of business curriculum or something like that. Right. But I'll tell you, like, um, you know, around 2010 or so, I, I almost stopped asking about lean because everybody had heard about it. Mm-hmm. And frankly, um, I think that that tells me that if you've heard about it, probably you generally agree with the principles, right? Uh, eliminating waste, putting the patient first, focusing mm-hmm. on flow and re kind of continuous improvement as a means to 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 engage the entire system in moving forward, right? Uh, I, I would say I stopped asking about lean. Um, I'd say I'd say queuing theory and some um, some other ones kind of um, uh, they've they've come a long way in terms of people hearing about them, but really applying them on the ground that probably still has a ways to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'd say just if anybody thinks that we've fixed healthcare or we've saturated healthcare with with lean principles or any performance improvement principles, demaic or whatever, um, I would kind of challenge that because sure. um, right, you know, we're not anywhere near the airline industry in terms of pre- prevention of defects, and we're not we're not um, we haven't sufficiently improved the care delivery models so that. So that it's highly reliable, right? In terms of mm-hmm. delivering high quality care in a system that's sustainable to work in from the people that do the work, right? So to me, if that's the kind of the goal or the gold standard is best care for guess best care for patients, um, sustainable from mm-hmm. from uh, people who work in the system at a cost that's affordable for the uh, the entire globe in a way that's satisfying. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. So yeah. um, I think we got a long way to go. So there's tons of opportunity, in my opinion. Yeah. And even the organizations where they've made the most progress, so let's say in a single organization, even in a single site hospital, still exists, you know, in some places. Yeah. Um, the ones that have made the most progress are the first to say, we're nowhere close. We, as, as we've made progress, now we see more problems and they think those problems are solvable. And, you know, so, yeah, I mean, clearly at a broader American health system standpoint, I don't think there's anyone, yeah, throwing around. If I throw out that hypothesis that somebody holds, it's probably a bad hypothesis that anybody holds 
the hypothesis that it's all been fixed. But let me, let me bring it back to one other question, maybe, because when you talk about um, asking who's heard of lean, over time, I agree with you, the number of hands going up um, would, would go up over time. But then the, the follow-up question I've learned that I have to ask is, well, what have you heard about lean? Or sometimes it's what are people assuming about lean? So in some way, and I think this is this holds lean back. There are organizations that um, will slap the lean label on a bunch of cost cutting exercises. And we'd probably agree that's not really, that's not what, right. what lean is. I remember one organization in particular having some of those first conversations with um, staff members and somebody spoke up and you could tell, like they said their um, their spouse was in a manufacturing company that had quote unquote done lean and there were a ton of layoffs. Oh, you hate to hear about that because that that's not really a Toyota based way of going about lean. So, you know, unfortunately, sometimes I think you have to check those assumptions and sort of dig in of like, have you heard, have they heard accurate information about lean or have they experienced things that we would wish the lean word was never associated with? I'm curious yeah, your thoughts or experiences there. Yeah, g- g- good point. And I, and I will say um, my always next follow on is, you know, how many of you have done a Kaizen event and how mm-hmm. many of you all have, um, have sort of done value stream mapping and map the future state. And, and I usually start a dialogue there. Um, and yeah, I think, I think you're right. There's varied responses, right. And I'll, I'll tell you, like, if you've ever been one of those in one of those lean, um, you know, Kaizen events or, or lean programs, that's, a, that's um, eventually led to cuts or, or, the soft cut, which is we're not hiring anymore, kind of, and we're going to let attrition kind of level the workforce. You quickly learn that lean's like not something I want to be a part of. Right. But if you if you're kind of in a uh, a lean program that's done right, where you're focusing on the patient, you're re- redesigning the the care um, pathways so that they're they they really work for the people working in the system, and they ultimately drive better care. Then I think those people kind of get the itch. And to mm-hmm. your point, these yeah. systems that have adopted it wholly, like UPMC or others, um, you know, it's it's an endless pursuit of continuous improvement because the very act of reaching a future state begets the next future state, right? Yeah. So it somewhat becomes addictive. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. There's these positive dynamics um and and even starting with baby steps like it's it's great to see when people start realizing they can actually change things they can actually make things better and they can participate in that and you know that participation you know when you ask that question of well who's been in a kaizen event john toussaint as a physician and ceo um you know who was actually participating in kaizen events himself he's He's tried to spread the word to other healthcare CEOs. I, I, I'd be curious how many ever took him up on it. My my wife is in a manufacturing company where the CEO does participate in Kaizen events. And it's just this different, and he's done so for a very long time. So it's just this different level of participation and learning. And you know, when the CEO is involved and understanding and realizing that they're they're driving the culture instead of just a bunch of projects happening that's that's yeah. even more powerful when you see that but i i wish we would see it more often in healthcare yep agreed um and then you know when you talk about attrition maybe you know one other thing to 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 look at here um if 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 you were really taking waste out of the work and realizing we don't need as many people then redeploying people or like you said taking advantage of, of attrition and not backfilling, that's less traumatic than layoffs would be. Um, but I think you kind of point to the challenge of if it's happening in the other direction of we're going to just choose to not hire replacements. Now you've got fewer people doing the same work. And as an industrial engineer, like your co-author Chuck Noon, I, you know, I think I always fall back on like the staffing levels need to be based on the work not right. on the budgets. And, you know, I think that's where we still have huge opportunity um, for, you know, if lean thinking were to become more widespread, some of these industrial engineering practices like queuing theory and that understanding and, you know, this idea of we're going to study the work, we're going to look and, and see 
how many people do we need to do the right work the right way? You know, I think it'd be better for the patients and it would it, it would create less of that burnout and moral injury. But I still see budgets and benchmarks being used more than the study of the actual work. I feel like I'm being gloomy about this, but I think it's part, well, of, the, it's part of the current I'll, state. Yeah, I'll, I'll offer a, kind of some insight here because I do think, um, you know, an example would be left out being seen rates in emergency departments are higher than they've ever been. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a function of, of A, probably not having the resources that you need to perform within the system that currently exists, right? So if you were able to redesign that system to make the system better for the resources that exist today, you're going to see more patients. It's going to be more satisfying for you as a nurse at the bedside to care for those patients and more patients are going to come. Subsequently, you're actually going to need more nurses, but from the system perspective, you've rooted out waste. So you're going to see more patients per nurse Mm -hmm. hour on, on any given day. Yeah. That nurse is going to be more satisfied with the care that they're delivering. And you're going to grow your bottom line because you're growing revenue, um, but not having to add as many resources as you as you would have over time. I will tell you that like there, there people know when you're cutting, however you're cutting, right? Because they show up and they've got five beds instead of four, or they've got six beds instead of five. So you can't hide that cutting mentality. Um, especially when it's done um, to them Mm -hmm. and they're not part of the redesign that enables them to be more effective in the care system that they're working in. So I I would say that, you know, um, it, it, it is, it is challenging to kind of see this from the clinician or the healthcare provider's eyes. But one thing that I am a hundred percent sure of when you engage them in the solution you always have a much better outcome. Well, that's very true. And so, um, you know, Jody, thank you for sharing um, your thoughts and perspectives with us. Thank you. I'm excited that you're going to be there at the Health Systems Process Improvement Conference coming up real soon. People can still sign up if they're able to go February 15th to 17th in Louisville. Again, look for uh, a link in the show notes um, for more information about that. And, you know, uh, I appreciate that you'll be there as a physician you know, talking to a room full of a lot of engineers, not not wholly engineers, but it is based on the um, Institute for Industrial and Systems Engineers. So your your clinical perspective, your leadership perspective, your improvement perspective, um, it's going. I'm, I'm excited you're going to be a part of it. So thank you in advance for that, Jody, and thank you for coming back on the podcast. Yeah, Mark, looking forward to seeing you in uh, in Louisville, and just just you know, I'm a closet engineer, right? So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, love engineering. Um, was in engineering in college. Prior to switching over to pre med, I was in right. aer- uh, aerospace engineering. Um, but listened to a couple buddies of mine and said, "Hey, you know, you should go into healthcare." And I've never regretted that decision. But I think it's enabled me to to practice my love, which is fixing things mm. and, and reengineering things, uh, while also make things better for patients and clinicians. So thanks for having me on the, on the podcast and I look forward to seeing you soon. Likewise.